bow together please in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank thee dear Lord for the privilege to come and meet together in the house of the Lord this afternoon. And oh Lord, we pray that we will again know the Lord's help in this season of worship. Come and touch all of our hearts, we pray. Lead us out in worship of our Lord's great name. We're going to commence our time of worship, please, by singing from the psalm section, singing from the psalm section of the hymn book, and it's the Psalm 139, the second version of the psalm, so Psalm 139, the second version, page 129, Lord, thou hast searched me, and hast known my rising up, and Lying down. And we're singing the first six verses of the psalm, so the words on page 129, and we'll stand as we sing of this. <laughs> Thy people, 
You see Christ in us. You see Christ's righteousness imputed to us. Oh Lord, how we rejoice that though once we stood in rags, that tonight we stand dressed in the righteous garment of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we rejoice that the Father delights in the Son. Such is redemption. The Father rejoices in those that are united to the Son. What a great message to declare. We see the hopelessness of works religion. We see the glory of salvation in Christ alone. Oh Lord, we pray that this will be a season when the Lord will again draw near to us. We thank Thee for these last weeks of we, as we have contemplated the subject of the Lord's table. And we pray that again this evening, as we come and consider this subject, that the help of the Lord will be given. We pray that we will be instructed, not just in our attitude to preparation for and reflection upon the table, but that this season tonight will be of use in all of our lives. And we pray that every communicant will be helped as well as our children that do not come to partake at the table as yet. We pray that the message tonight will be of value even to them. And should there be any in the meeting that are unconverted or anyone that is listening to the message tonight that is unconverted, O oh Lord, we pray that hearts will be touched, that hearts will be opened. Lord, that lost ones will be brought unto thyself. O oh Lord, we thank thee for this witness that you've raised up. We thank thee, Lord, for sustaining it. And we thank thee, Lord, for every mercy given. We pray, Lord, that we will continue to see mercies. We commend the witness to the boys and girls over these next days. And Lord, we do pray that you will bless not only the children of this flock and other congregations where children will come from. We pray that we'll even see children brought in who have no contact with the gospel. And oh Lord, we pray that you will be pleased to touch hearts we pray that we will see boys and girls being brought on to a knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray for those in the congregation in times of sickness, in times of trouble, in times of anxiety. And we commend all of thy people to thee. Be pleased to minister to them, we pray. And we pray that in the midst of trouble that their eyes will be lifted, but they will know the joy of the Lord to be their strength. And so, Lord, come and graciously undertake for us here and bless every light gathering across our land. Our Lord, we long that in our nation that we will see times of reviving and refreshing. And Lord, that in a land that has departed so far from the gospel, a land that has departed into atheism and materialism, we cry to thee, O Lord, that the Church of Christ will be humbled. And, o Lord, we pray that there will be a brokenness upon all of us as God's people, and a looking then afresh to the Lord for the reviving breath of God. Come and use this congregation and our sister churches as an instrument in thy hand and every faithful witness across our land. 
We pray that we will see a new thing done in our Lord's great name. Continue with us, we pray. In our Lord's name we ask. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn in our hymn books again, please, to the words of the hymn 281. 281. Great gospel hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood, dr blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that blood and lose all their guilty stains. And we're going to use the chorus at the end of the hymn. So the chorus just over the page. Hallelujah to the Lamb who died on my Mount Calvary. So 281 but using the chorus that is over the page. And we'll stand as we worship the Lord in these beautiful words. Corinthians 13, 
reading from the verse 1. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. Being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking to me, which is to you word, sorry, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him. We shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, or except ye be unapproved. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not yet reprobates. And I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. And we will the Lord bless the reading of his precious truth. We're going to have the larger catechism at this point. And the questions over the last weeks have been dealing with the subject of sin and the imputation of sin, that is, that as Adam sinned, all of mankind sinned in him. And it's question 26 that we're looking at then tonight. How is original sin conveyed from our first parents onto their posterity? Original sin is conveyed from our first parents unto their posterity by natural generation. So as all that proceed from them in that way are conceived and born in sin. And so the answer is emphasizing something that I've been mentioned in the comments over these last weeks. That as Adam sinned and was guilty, we all are guilty. And very often we speak of sin, we, we think of our actual sin, but we have this very sin nature. And the sin nature is conveyed then by natural generation. When Adam sinned, his very nature was now sin. Uh, Adam's nature, sorry, Eve's nature was sin. And therefore as the first child was conceived that first child was conceived in sin and born in sin and every child sins Psalm 51 verse 5 Behold I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me and so in church history there was someone that tried to teach 
that we are not born as sinners. So Pelagius had this teaching that we sin because we witness sin and so we follow the example of others. And that heresy then was exposed primarily by Augustine in his great defense of the truth of original sin. And later that teaching of Pelagius was modified and today is often referred to then as semi-Pelagianism which is the view of Romanism uh, as well as the, the view of uh, Arminianism where they still accept this idea that there is some transfer of sin but not in the full sense that we have here in the Catechism that we are fully depraved in our very nature, in our very conception, in our birth. Our Lord explained the awfulness of man's predicament when he was speaking with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and the verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And we all have this problem by our natural birth. Therefore, the need of man is the need of the new birth. Except a man be born again, born from above. And so it's on account of this sin problem, this sin nature, that we need then the new birth. We need that, that gift of faith and repentance to be given. We need regeneration. And praise God as we think of those around us who like us have been conceived in sin. There's a message of hope. We believe in the new birth. The Lord is able to give life to that which is dead. May the Lord bless those few thoughts to our hearts. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. It's good to see each one gathered in the house of the Lord. And we trust that the Lord will draw near to us this evening. And we will hear the Lord's voice speaking to us afresh and hopefully uh, the meeting has been a uh, webcast live and sermon audio and we welcome anyone that is watching in on the sermon audio. The Kabinki family from the Philippines were planning to uh, join with us this evening and if you're able to see us then we welcome the Kabinki family in our Saviour's precious name and uh, they've had the flu over the last few days and have been unable to be out and about. Um, trust that the Lord will raise them up to a full measure of health and strength. And we have been praying for Mrs. Kabinki's father in uh, these days of illness that the Lord will speak to his heart and the family will uh, know much grace even in his uh, time of weakness. And so welcome everybody this evening. And we do look to the Lord for his help. Remember the meetings over the next three days with the children. And we do encourage you to pray much that the Lord will minister to the hearts of the children. And in relation to that, I'll ask if some could help with moving tables and chairs after the meeting tonight to help uh, with the meeting tomorrow morning. Then prayer meetings as usual in the in coming week of the services next Lord's Day at the usual times of God willing I'll be here to minister next Lord's Day. I think these are all the necessary announcements. We're going to turn again in our hymn books and we're turning to the hymn 479. 479 and as we sing these words the offering for the work of God will be received 479 remaining seated please at the beginning search me O God my actions try and let my life appear as seen by thine all, all searching eye to my, my ways make clear I forgot to mention that uh, there were glasses found this morning so if you lost your glasses or if you know if someone lost glasses this morning they're here at the pulpit. Uh, so 479 remaining seated at the beginning. So.
solemn and joyful at the same time. You think of a wedding. We normally think of a wedding as a joyful time. And yet there's a very solemn aspect to a wedding. In the past, weddings were spoken of, or at least the saying of the vows, the hearing of vows, spoken of as the solemnizing of marriages. And I think we would do well to return to that particular language, the solemnizing of marriages. We see in marriage then the seriousness of making a vow before God. And when we come to the table, it's as if we are renewing those gospel vows before the Lord. That we have covenanted that God is our God. And so George West Fraser and his hymn, he got it right when he said, With joy and yet with sorrow, we do remember thee. So there is this solemn, serious aspect to it. There's this judgment that we talked about last Lord's Day afternoon. For an unworthy receiver. And I come back to this point that it's a sweet time, so we should want to be there. Paul says, let a man examine himself. So that he will come. So that he will partake. So this examination is key to our petition, participation at the table. And the examination is self-examination. If you look with me again there in verse 28. Verse 28. Let a man examine himself. Now this is not to say that the oversight of the church have no responsibility in examination. So this verse is not suggesting that God's people, since they have a duty to self-examination, that the elders have no responsibility at all. So there has been this debate among Christians, and it's a debate among the administration of the table. Should we have what is called a closed table, or an open table? Closed table meaning something like this, that only communicant members that are not under discipline should partake at the table. The open table position is something then like this, that anyone can come, under the proviso, of course, that they profess to be a Christian, but if someone makes that profession, they can partake at the table. And I believe it's best to navigate a channel between those two extremes. The table is to be ordered. The table is to be controlled. Is to, there is to be discipline. And so, we should not exclude those that have not to come into church membership. So, of course, we encourage God's people to come into church membership, but we should not deny the sacrament to those that are not in membership, I believe. But the elders do have a duty to guard the table. There will then be times when people are asked not to partake, or people are not served. And you might say, well, why is that so when it says, let a man examine himself? Because the elder will give an account unto God for his care of the flock. And that relates to every part of his duty, not just to the serving at the table. Hebrews 13, 17, obey them, this is to the congregation, obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they, the elders, watch for your souls as they that must give account. And the elder then, as the distribution takes place, he will give account. And it will not do for him to say, well, I just let every man decide for himself. No, he has a responsibility. But the emphasis of the verse tonight, and therefore the emphasis of our thoughts, is this duty upon the Christian for self-examination. For the elders, look at the outward evidence. 
you as the individual Christian have a duty to look inwardly, to examine your heart. And it's only you that can examine your heart before the Lord. And so then I've entitled the message, Self-Examination in Preparation for the Lord's Table. First of all, I want us to see the necessity, the necessity of self-examination for the Lord's Table. But I want us to think of this word, examine. Let a man examine himself. And the particular Greek word that here is translated, translated examine, has to do with testing. Let a man test himself. Now this word is used in a number of different contexts. But it is this Greek word that is used to describe the testing associated with purifying or refining. In Western Australia we have the gold mining. When that gold is mined in Kalgoorlie, what they mine in Kalgoorlie is not immediately taken to the jewelers. There is a, a refining process. Because what is dug out of the earth in Kalgoorlie is full of impurities. So we're not saying there's any problem as it were with the mine. But there, is a, there are impurities. And so there must be this refining process. There must be this purifying, this examining we, examining we could say. And this is the Greek word that would be used to describe that. So any concept of putting something into the kiln, into the fire, this is the word that would be used. Now it's important we see that. Because it shows us why the Christian must prepare to come to the we must examine ourselves because we have impurities. As you heard this morning, there's absolutely none of us that are sinlessly perfect. Far from it. We have many impurities. Uh, the Word of God does describe us as gold. We are the Lord's gold. This lump of gold in the pulpit as well as each lump in the pew tonight. And therefore as we come to the table, recognizing the solemn nature of it, it's vital that those impurities are confessed. That they are recognized. And that our yearning would be that in preparing for the table that these impurities would be burned off. Now, in this preparation we recognize that there will be impurities still there. And yet, it's our desire that the impurities would be burned off. And so in this examination, the idea is not, I examine myself to see how good I am. And sadly, that's how some people have looked at this verse. So I examine myself and I say, oh yes, I really have ticked the boxes since I last came to the table. I can come again this time. That is not what the Word is saying. The Word is saying you have absolutely not ticked the boxes. And therefore you must examine. You must see that there are the impurities. Now it is possible <coughs> on account of our frailties and our own sinfulness to excuse ourselves that we would look at ourselves and think, oh maybe I am ticking some of the boxes. We are to recognize that there are what we call common graces. So we might look at ourselves and say, well, I have some graces. We are 
to remember there are common graces. There are kind people in our community tonight who do not know anything about the gospel. There are people who do kind deeds. Now their kind deeds are still flawed by sin. But they do do kind things. So it's not enough for us to look inwardly and say, I have done kind things. Because the ungodly can say the same. There are common graces and there are counterfeit graces. Remember the Pharisees could do many things that looked attractive outwardly. The Lord called them whitewashed sepulchres. You're like a grave. That has been painted to look nice, but still full of dead men's bones on the inside. So it's not enough then to really look and try to find the nice things. Or to realize that there are many impurities there. Now the natural man resists examination. I believe it's only grace that would bring us to examine ourselves as the scripture exhorts us to examine ourselves. Do you remember that time when Ahab had joined up with Jehoshaphat and Jehoshaphat ought not to have done so, but Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet that we can consult with? And the response came, there is that prophet, Micaiah. But Ahab's thought was, I don't want to consult with him. Because he never prophesied good unto me, but all was evil. And why does the sinner, the unregenerate sinner, not want to expose himself to the searchlight of God's word? Because God's word is going to be like that prophet. The word of God is going to show us our sin. The natural man resists that. Remember, when God created man, as we learned last Lord's Day morning in the children's lesson, God made man in God's image. God made man to be a thinker. And part of that thinking surely involves this examination of heart. Now in the fall, what has happened is, man is quite happy to examine another. And so we're quite happy to look into the speck in the eye of another and complain about it. Do a lot of damage in trying to pull that speck out of the eye of another. And all the time tolerate the plank in her own eye. That is fallen nature. Because we have been regenerated. Restored as it were to the image of God. There is to be this self-examination. Looking for the plank in our own eyes. We're not to resist it. The necessity of self-examination. But I want to see then, secondly, the design in self-examination for the Lord's table. Why do we do it? Well, we've already seen that we do it because we recognize that we have the impurities. But then we examine ourselves because the whole design here is, the whole purpose is, that having examined ourselves, we will come to the table. So verse 28, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. Examine himself, and so let him eat. When I was at university, I met a Christian who had rightly got a sense of the solemn nature of the table, of the, table the serious nature of partaking at the table. And he said that he could never partake at the table. Because if there was anyone in that church building that he resented in any way, then it would not be right for him to partake. 
Now he was right in that sense that if there's resentment, you are to put it right first. That's part of the preparation and then come partake. Matthew 5, 23, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee or something against you, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother. Then come and offer the gift. Now while the Lord is not specifically dealing there with the table, the application of the Christian life, I would say chiefly, is that. And so when there's a problem with a brother or a sister, sort it out. And then come to the table. And so the young man was right in that sense, but he was wrong in this. <laughs> And that he saw the warnings in 1 Corinthians 11 as meaning, it is better to stay away. And so he would have thought of those words in verse 27. Whosoever shall eat of this bread, drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body of the Lord. Verse 29. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation. Or as I showed you last week, it's also judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We can't ignore the verse in between. So verses 27 and 29 are absolutely true. And Paul says, in light of that, let a man examine himself so that he will be able to come. Now for the unconverted man, as he examines himself, for the false professor, as he examines himself, he is to say, I'm not to partake. But for the believer, he is to self-examine and partake. Now the examination is not intended to make us look inwardly and say, oh yes, I've done well. Good enough. So now I come to the table. If that's our thought after self-examination, we shouldn't partake. Because you've missed the point. The point is that we look inwardly and we see our sin. We see our falling short and we cast ourselves in and so there's a difference, as I showed you last time, between worthy receivers and worthy receiving. And so the wrong view is, I examine myself so I will be a worthy receiver. No, you examine yourself and you say, Lord, I am unworthy. But I will come then as a worthy or sorry, I come to worthy receive. I come to the place of worthy receive. I come in the right manner. The right manner then is to say, I am unworthy, but I have come because of Christ. I cast myself upon another. And the design then in the examination is this. I see the impurities. But I lift my eyes to him that is pure. I lift my eyes to that gold in whom there has never been any impurity, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And in recognition of that, I come to the table. So the design is that we might come. We come then thirdly to look at the focus of self-examination. For what is it that we are examining? Verse 28, let a man examine himself. And so in this place the apostle does not say, examine your love. He does not say, examine your faith. He does not say, examine your walk. Now undoubtedly, all of those things are implied and in. And yet he speaks much more generally. Let a man examine himself. And I believe that 
we are to see it then in the context here. Let a man examine himself if he can come and partake in this worthy manner. In other words, as he is examining himself, his mind is to come and to think of the elements on the table itself. His mind comes and thinks about the bread, speaking of Christ's broken body. In this self-examination he comes and he thinks about the cup, speaking of the shed blood. As our Lord said, it's the cup of the New Testament, the New Covenant, the blood is shed for you. And the Christian then, in this self-examination, he is asking himself the question, where do I stand in relation to the elements? The Lord said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Again, they are only elements. They're symbolizing the body and the blood. But we are to see the, this strong correlation between the symbol and the reality. And you see, therefore, as we see all of those impurities implied in this word example, we then remember. That it's because of those impurities Christ's body was broken. It's because of those impurities Christ's blood was shed. And therefore with joy and sorrow we come and partake at the table. Surely when we are examining our hearts in preparation for the table. We could ask the question in another sense. We, should, we could ask it in this way. Will I sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb? And how would we answer that question in the affirmative? Our answer in the affirmative ought to be, I will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb because of the Lord's broken body and his shed blood. But we'll be at that great table. And it's our confidence will be there on the basis of Christ's work when we come to this table that points us to that marriage supper. If you could turn with me then to 2 Corinthians 13. We read these words earlier in the meeting. And the context here has to do with some in the city of Corinth, in the, the church in Corinth, who really denied that Paul was sent of God, they questioned, if not outwardly denied, his credentials. Uh, Paul was a very direct man. And he essentially is saying in this chapter, you've been examining whether I have the credentials of an apostle of one sent of God, I am sent of God, but you need to examine your hearts if you're really Christians or not. So in verse 5, examine yourselves, whether you begin the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. In that verse 5, where it says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. The word that's translated prove here is the word examine back in 1 Corinthians 11. So don't want that to be confusing because we do have also another Greek word that's translated examine here. But it's the word that's translated prove that is actually the Greek word that we are thinking about tonight. And if you have the Westminster Bible, you'll see that that word means test or to try. This idea of being put into fire. Prove your own 
themselves. Examine yourselves whether you be in the thief. Not merely do you have some belief, but are you in the faith? Are you found in Christ? Know ye, not, know, ye, know ye not your own selves how that Christ Jesus is in you? So are you in the faith? Are you in Christ? And is Christ in you? This is part of this examination, this proving. Paul's longing is that these professing Christians come to be sure that they are in the faith, that they are not reprobates. And the word reprobates actually comes from this word meaning to test. And so the word is translated reprobates, unapproved, at the end of verses 5 and 6. It has this idea put to the test but failed to in this case, it's failed the test in the sense that they were not in the Lord at all. But Paul's desire is that as they would be examined, they would be sure that they are in the faith and that Christ is in them. There is then to be this examination. And there is this focus on where we stand with Christ himself. So as I've said, to come to the table saying I have not sinned in the past week would be unworthy receiving. To say I've reached a great pinnacle of my Christian life so I can come to the table, that would be unworthy receiving. Rather, we're to think of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, mourn over their sin. Then, the fourth Beatitude, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And you see, when we come and examine ourselves, and we mourn over our sin, what we say, O oh Lord, I yearn after thee. My heart is after thee. I long to know more of thee. I long to overcome the failures. There's an appetite. That's the appetite that's needed for supper. A hungry after God. We come to the table. Fellowship. Isn't that what we associate eating with at home when we sit down and we communicate with our families? We come to the table recognizing the unity among us as God's people, and we'll look at that in the future time, God willing. We have this sweet fellowship with the Lord himself. Now, there are two extremes to avoid in the Christian life. Sometimes there are Christians who are in continual doubt and fear. Uh, they refuse to take God at his word. And so they're always in doubt whether they're really converted or not. On the other hand, there are Christians who are in continual ease. In the sense that there's no soul searching or very little soul searching. Very little sorrow over their own sin. And those are two extremes that we are to avoid. And it reminds us that it's possible for someone to be saved and yet to be in doubt about the larger catechism, question 172. If you're taking notes, I would encourage you to look that up. The larger catechism 172. It talks about the doubting Christian. What is he to do in this whole examination? And there's a very pastoral answer there. 
where the one that's full of doubt is to bewail his unbelief. He is to lament his wavering. He is to come to the table to be strengthened. So it's possible for someone to be saved and yet be in doubt of it. And yet we're also to recognize it's possible for someone not even to be saved, but confident that they are. So someone could be so casual, they have never searched their heart, and they're absolutely confident that everything is well, and yet they're not in the Lord. Paul is warning them, except you be reprobate. So, examine yourselves. And in that examination, be brought to the cross. You see, if in our self-examination, at the end of that whole process, you're just looking inward, you've missed the point because the table is all about the cross. So we look inward, and then we say, thank the Lord for the cross. And that brings us then fourthly to the instrument for self examination, the instrument for self-examination. Remember this word, examine, it has to do with the idea of a kiln, of a refinery. What is the crucible that we are to be cast in, in our self-examination? The crucible, the fire, is the word of God says. So we come to the flames, as it were, of the Word of God, that our impurities might be exposed and we might know a fresh cleansing as we come to the table. Of course, a whole series of passages could be preached on this. For example, we could come to Galatians 5. We read about the works of the flesh. Then we read of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What do we say? We say, I lack the evidence. My self-control is not what it ought to be. My patience is not what it ought to be. My love is not what it ought to be. But I yearn for it. We read 2 Peter 1, remember that great passage on adding, add to thy faith, virtue, and so on. Knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, love. Lord, I long for those. We read in 1 John about the evidence of love for the brethren. Perhaps as we examine our hearts, we say, my love is not what it ought to be. Cast ourselves upon the Word of God and upon the mercy of God. The Word of God does pierce, does Praise God for the mercy that there is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread. 1 John 5, 13, we read these things have I written unto you. And in the context, of course, it's very especially the epistle of John, 1 John. We can say it's true of the whole Bible. These things have I written unto you, that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that your doubts may be cast away. And so as we come to the word, so often it is pain painful. The fire tries us. Yet, just as we were convicted the day of our conversion, we are to be convicted. 
casting ourselves upon the Lord. As we come to a close, dear unconverted one, is it that time that you saw your need? If the people of God see their need, and they ought to, how do you ought to see your need? As God would test you tonight, as God would examine you, He sees all your failure. And as you stand answering only for yourself, and only yourself to answer in favour for yourself, your case is lost. You need Christ. You need one who will come and say, I died for that sin. I rose again for that sinner I ascended. May you sense that even tonight. Run to Christ. Be saved. May the Lord take his word and write it upon our hearts. We're going to sing in closing 644. 600. And 44, the principles that we have been looking at tonight, I trust, will not only be of benefit to the table, but every day. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, and know my thoughts. I pray. 644, and we'll stand together.
search in our hearts. May we even say tonight, search me, O God. Psalm 139 is that Psalm emphasizing the Lord's omniscience. Psalm then says, search me. As our hearts are examined and the impurities are there, we all have them. And we know that fresh strength. Our gracious Lord. We thank Thee for Thy mercy. How thankful we are, Lord, that Your Word is not saying that we must be without sin to come to the table. We can never come. And yea, Lord, the more we grow in grace, the more we see our sin. Cast ourselves then upon thee tonight afresh. <clears throat> Cleanse us. Make us more like thy dear son. And, oh Lord, we pray that in this week that we will know more and more of that scrutiny of the Lord to rest upon us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, Communion of the Holy Ghost be with you.